Greetings and welcome to Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 16. I've entitled the lesson today, A Healthy Body. So we'll be talking about carbs, fat, exercise. No, of course, just kidding. Um, but we will be talking about really the marks of a healthy spiritual body. And the body in question is the church body, um, both the local congregation, but it, it would apply wherever the church is found, the marks of a healthy body. So having moved from the great teaching of the church, Ephesians 1 through 3, the great doctrines of the church, the great realities of what we possess in Christ, what Christ has done for us, uh, sanctification, redemption, all of those things, we now move into the application, chapters 4, 5, and 6 of the book of Ephesians, really focusing on because of what Christ has done for us and what we'll see next week, because of who we are, it really impacts how we should behave, how we should act. It works out in the application. I say it over and over again, theology has deep roots um, that connect it with application. What we believe impacts how we act, how we live our lives. Now, in all honesty, and you'll see this next week, I suspect we'll continue to see new aspects of doctrine flow out of Paul's ethical instructions. But the focus this morning, according to Paul, is about being what he would call, what I would call, a healthy church. And these first 16 verses really break down into three main areas. Um, a healthy church is marked by spiritual unity. A healthy church is marked by spiritual diversity and a healthy church is marked by spiritual maturity. So having said all that, just by way of reminder, we are in the book of Ephesians. I think this is lesson nine. This is one of the prison epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians, written by Paul while he was under house arrest in Rome. A timeline by way of reminder, the church was established on the second missionary journey as Paul preached in synagogues, um, it was strengthened on the third missionary journey as Paul labored in Ephesus for some three years. And then finally, we find ourselves, you know, five years from that point as Paul is writing back to this church in Ephesus. Again, he's writing to a church that he mentions no problems, no doctrinal issues, no behavior concerns, no this person is acting in sin. Um, it really seems to be a letter of just further explanation of theology and the application of that theology, pointing at no particular theological problems or no problems of conduct or sinful living. By way of reminder, the city of Ephesus is a harbor city, was a harbor city on the Aegean Sea, um, a beautiful city, but as I've said in many cases, and we'll look at this even more next week, a very pagan city, a very sinful city. Um, with the temple to Diana, the temple to Artemis being here to the north from our display. Um, again, established on the second missionary journey, strengthened on the third missionary journey. And again, by way of reminder, the church at Ephesus was the first church in the seven churches that the letter of the Revelation was written to. Uh, at that point, she was no longer a healthy church. And although Paul had nothing to say, our Lord had plenty to say. Uh, to this church. And so it's a reminder that a church today um, with no doctrinal error and with no major issues can be a church tomorrow that has issues, that has doctrinal errors. And it's incumbent upon us as believers to continue to search the scriptures to see if the things that our pastor is saying are so. And it's the job of the pastor to continually be in the scriptures, ensuring that what he says and what he teaches are indeed the word of God and they represent the scriptures. So although we are shifting now as we come to chapter 4 from deep theology uh, to matters of application, we cannot lose Jesus in the shift. I said this multiple times to my Sunday school class, and you'll keep hearing it from me while we're here in these lessons of application. If I can teach Sunday school where a Mormon or a Jehovah Witnesses, those who deny that Jesus is God, those who deny in the complete work of Jesus Christ is the only thing necessary to save us. If someone can set in any one of my lessons from those two positions, from those two faith camps, from those two places of belief, and not have a problem with something I say about Jesus, then I have not espoused Jesus enough, and I focus too much on work. Because work will never save us. What saves us is the Lord Jesus Christ. He redeems us. He justifies us, and even sanctifies us. 
And the growing sanctification across our lives has nothing to do with our redemption other than it started because we were redeemed. So even when we talk about a sermon or a lesson, in today's case, about our walk, it is a great reminder that no flesh is going to be justified by the works of the law. And so we can never forget that. So let's get into our lesson. Chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Verse 1, Paul once again reminds his readers that he's a prisoner, not of Rome, but of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not of Caesar, but of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've looked at this. We won't dive into it, but it is absolutely true. It is true uh, in the spiritual sense, as he's the apostle to the Gentiles, but it's true in the natural sense. He was locked up. He was in Jerusalem there. When all this broke out, it was about they thought he had brought Greeks into the temple. He was so identified with the Gentiles that the Jews had begun to look suspect on this one-time Pharisee of Pharisees, this one-time Benjamite, um, so much so that this would result in his imprisonment. Now, as we get rolling, two Greek words I want to draw to you, your attention as he says that we're to walk worthy of the calling with which we were called. The first word is, and I'll mess up the pronunciation, but it's para, para, tateo. Peritatio, I think is how you pronounce that with the alpha and then the, so peritatio. It's really your conduct. It's really the way your life flows. It's the flow of your life. So when he says, I beseech you to walk, he's saying, I beseech that your life would be in a flow that's worthy of the calling. The word translated worthy or suitable is axios. It literally means that it's worthy, that it reflects suitability. And so Paul is telling his readers, he's telling us by way of extension, that we, the flow of our life, should be worthy, should be suitable of the great calling of the Lord Jesus Christ on our life. Live in a manner worthy of the fact that God, God has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Maxi Dunham, in his commentary on Ephesians, commenting on walking worthy of our calling, wrote, Our ethic is not a demand laid upon us, to which we seek to respond only out of the resources of our lives and the performance of which makes us acceptable to God. In Christianity, we do not begin with moral demands, nor do we envision a God whose attention we may get by religious rite or ritual. We know no God whom we must somehow find or to whom we must somehow strain and struggle to arrive. Ours is seeking a God who has already found us, that we would walk worthy of a manner of the great God who called us out of darkness. I just will give you this thought. Our walk never renders us worthy of our calling. Rather, in our calling and rebirth, we are provided with the power and the obligation to walk in a manner worthy of the reality that we have been called into God's kingdom. Now, if you remember back to lessons one and two, we dealt with the lofty truths of God's choosing us and of predestination. A verse, verses I quote all the time, Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto adoption uh, of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. Paul is reminding his readers, God called you out of darkness. Live in a manner worthy of your calling. Now, we could probably stop right here, and before we discuss the corporate church, or before we discuss a healthy body, before we talk about intensely personal, intensely practical issues, God has called us into his kingdom. Live every minute of your life in a manner that's suitable of that high call. 
Tony Morita said this, our whole lives are to be lived in light of the gospel. Verse two, now Paul helps define what this worthy of the call life looks like by providing five great points. Then there are more, these are only examples, but they help us understand what a life lived in wor worthily of the great high calling would look like. And so we come to point one in verse two, that we would live a life with all lowliness. The Greek word is humility. Now what's interesting about humility is this only became a virtue after Christ walked this planet. Nowhere in the ancient world prior to Jesus is humility a virtue. We live in a day and age where when humility is viewed as weakness and again rarely seen as a virtue. But yet the truth of the scripture is you and I are to live a life like Jesus, a life lived out in humility. Philippians 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. You see, just as he humbled himself, both in the incarnation and in the crucifixion, you and I are to live a life like that, a life of humility. Jesus said, Matthew 23, 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Now, we don't humble ourselves to be exalted. Rather, because God has already exalted us, we humble ourselves. And 1 Peter 5, 5b reminds us that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. But point number one is we're to live in humility. Point number two, verse two, with all gentleness. Now, the word translated gentleness is normally the word for meekness. It's like the twin tower, meekness and humility. Now it has nothing to do with weakness, but rather, as we talked about in the Sunday school lesson, it is, dream, it is strength under control. It is strength under submission. And I would remind you that gentleness is a fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5, right? The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control against such there is no law. Um, again, gentleness, you and I are to live a life of meekness, fruit of the Spirit. Point number three, with long-suffering. Patience, perseverance, that's the idea. This word describes a spirit that never gives up, a spirit that never gives in, not because we have it within ourselves, but because we have the Spirit of God living within us. It's patience mingled with perseverance. It's long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Um, again, love, joy, peace, patience is that long-suffering Greek word. Verse 2.4, we're to bear with one another in love. The idea is accepting one another in love. Now, we often express this idea in a very negative way. Like uh, we say things like this, or I'll say it, I can't bear to hear another word. Well, what God's telling us is because we're in one body, because we are one group of believers, because we are the body of Christ, we are to bear with one another in love. We are to accept one another. We're to bear with one another. And by the way, this agape, that's the word there, the love, it's this unconditional love, is also the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, right? And then finally, we come to point five of his five points as we launched into this of um really these great points of what it means to live a life worthy of the high calling of God in our life. Point five, endeavoring, working, keeping, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Eagerly working to keep the unity of the Spirit. And yes, I would say peace too is a fruit of the Spirit. But I hope you see the convergence of Paul's points and the fruit of the Spirit. These things are not what we work out these are things that God's working in in our life. And as we live them out, we're working out what he's working in. And so unity and peace, I would argue, or at least I would add that it's the gospel that brought that unity and peace. And it's the gospel and a focus on the gospel in our lives that will maintain that unity and peace. Summarize, because God has saved us. Therefore, we should walk worthy of such an amazing call. Walking with humility, meekness, patience and perseverance, bearing with one another in love, working with one another in the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, endeavoring to keep that unity.
Verse 4. Now this forms what scholars believe is an early Christian creed, the seven one statements. It reminds me of the Reformation, except it's bigger. So verse 4, one body. Now if Paul has made any point up to this point, it's that Jews and Gentiles are now, amazingly, the mystery of the gospel, one body in Christ, made up of both Jews and Gentiles. Quoting Romans 12, 4 through 5, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. His first one statement is one body. Number next, verse 4, one spirit. Now there are not different Holy Spirits, equally they're not degrees of the Holy Spirit. There is one body, that's the church, Jews and Gentiles, and there's one Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, and we get all of him when we become saved. And, and at that point, the whole Holy Spirit, not degrees of the Holy Spirit or portions of the Holy Spirit or different Holy Spirits, the Holy Spirit lives within us. In fact, as we look at the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul tells us there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. We talk about this in Sunday school. Each of us has been uniquely gifted, but we all have the same Spirit, and those gifts came from the same Spirit. Number next, one body, one Spirit, one hope of your calling. We all share a common hope in Christ. And apart from Christ, we're without hope, Ephesians 2.12. And so just as there's one body, one spirit, there's one hope in our calling. There's not multiple hopes. There's not multiple layers, not multiple levels. There's one hope. And that hope is eternity with God in Christ. There's one Lord. Now, this is critical to the Jew and the Gentile discussion. There is one Kyrios. When what Peter said to the Jewish crowds at Pentecost is applicable here, Acts 2.36. He said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, both Kyrios and Christos. There is one Lord. But number next, one faith, one hope, one Lord, one faith. We have, we have, here we have the idea that a profession of faith, um, is a profession into a common body of truth accepted by all the members of the body. Jew and Gentile, black and white, there is one common body of truth. There are fundamentals, if we will, of the faith. We can disagree on whether the whether there's a seven-year tribulation, a three-and-a-half-year tribulation, or whether the tribulation um, doesn't have a specific period of time, or whether we're in the tribulation right now or not in the tribulation. All those things we can disagree about. Where we must agree is that the Lord is coming back. You see, there's one common body of truth. There is one faith, and we make profession into that faith. There's one baptism, verse, thir this, verse 6. I was going to say 36. I don't know where that came from. Verse 6. All believers share a common experience of being spiritually baptized by one Holy Spirit into one body in Christ. Equally, there's only one baptism. It's the outward rite where people make the claim that they believe the one faith and they're submitting to the one Lord Jesus Christ and they're baptized in the name of the one Father, the one Son, and the one Holy Spirit. And then finally, verse 6, there's one baptism, baptism and there's one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. There's only one Father. Um, now, I would say, hopefully you caught that we did the Trinity here, that there's one Lord, one Spirit, and one God. Um, but again, there's one body, one calling, one faith, and one baptism. I would remind us of what Jesus prayed in that great high priestly prayer in John 17. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. There's one body, and that one body is in the one Christ and in the one God. So the first thing um, that Paul would have us see in these five points of walking worthy of the great calling that God has placed on our life. We now transition um, to really point two, and that's a healthy church is marked by spiritual diversity. So the first point, as we wrap it up, really, is that a healthy church is marked by spiritual unity. 
Um, and you can see that in those first verses, one body, one Lord, one faith, one hope, one spirit, one baptism, one God and Father. So a healthy church is marked by spiritual unity. We come to the second point, uh, beginning in verse 4, or excuse me, verse 7, and that's that a healthy church is marked by spiritual diversity. A healthy church is marked by spiritual diversity. So spiritual unity, the ones, spiritual diversity, verses 7 through 12. But to each one of us, <clears throat> grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended, and also the one who ascended, far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now the conjunction, but, forms the transition of thought from the unity of the body to the diversity that exists yet in perfect unity. Verse 7. Um, here we have the reminder that each of us has not only received grace, grace in the sense of salvation, but we've each been given a unique grace gift. There's diversity within this unity, and it's here at the matter of gifts that we've been given by the Spirit that we begin to see this unfold. One baptism into one body, but each of those brought into the body is uniquely gifted by God. In fact, I'll quote 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences in administration, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God who worketh all in all. For the manifestation of the Spirit hath been given to each one of us to profit all. And then he goes on to say, one, the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge, to another, faith. It just goes right down the list. All these different gifts given individually, but to be used in the one body. Verse 8, therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, this is very interesting because what Paul does is quote Psalm 68 18. So we need to talk about this just briefly because I would have never ran here to make the point that Paul's going to make, um, but let's see it unfold. So in the historical grammatical context here, what's being celebrated is the arrival of the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, into Jerusalem. The picture is the following of the conquest of the enemies of God, the enemies of God's citadel, Jehovah is pictured leading the captives in an open show over their defeat, and then he ascends the earthly sanctuary of Mount Zion to take his rightful place as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the Holy of Holies. Now here, Paul, looking at this event, this beautiful picture of Yahweh ascending in Psalm 68, 18, and he finds his higher fulfillment in Christ's open defeat of sin, death, hell, and the grave. He makes an open show of these vanquished enemies. He's pictured walking with them in his train. He is seen in his triumphant ascension, in his resurrection, as the sovereign God ascending the universal sanctuary in heaven and taking his universal sovereign seat in heaven, and from there he dispenses gifts and graces to his church. The ascension of Christ, following the resurrection of Christ, the picture could be no clearer. Having triumphed over sin, death, hell, the grave, he takes his rightful seat in the heavens and gives the church gifts to minister within the body and even outside the body. Tony Maria, in his commentary in verses 7 and 8, summed it up like this. Christ Jesus died, rose, and ascended into heaven as the victorious king with all authority and gave gifts to his people, displaying extravagant generosity. Verses 9 and 10 serve as a parenthesis. Uh, my practice when I read these in the Bible is to first read without the parenthesis so I get the flow and then go back and pick up the parenthetical 
so that I handle it correctly. So let's read verses 7, 8, skip the parenthetical 11 and 12. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men, or to men, skipping to verse 11. And he himself gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body. Okay, now the gifts that Paul has in mind in context become crystal clear. So now let's grab the uh, parenthetical, read it again. Oh, sorry about that. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he first also, first also that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, this ascension clearly is back to heaven. What does it mean that he ascended? Well, it's obvious that he had to first descend. If he came from heaven, and we're talking about his ascension back to heaven, then Paul's point is, the obvious is that he first had to descend here. As surely as the resurrection is the ascension, the descension is the incarnation. And Paul is saying the certainty of the incarnation or the descension is the ascension back to his rightful place in heaven. In the descent, God took upon himself the form of man, was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2. And the descension is proven by the ascension. The ascension gives evidence, in spite of all appearances, that this common-looking man was indeed God. And when they nailed him to the cross, they killed or attempted to kill God. But then at Calvary, what really happened is God killed death, hell, and defeated the grave for his people. The ascended Lord is the one who first descended to live a vicarious life in our place and died a sacrificial death, sacrificed for us, all to redeem us. Now, Paul speaks of that descent and ascent in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. I kind of quoted him a minute ago. I won't quote him again, but that's what Paul is talking about. Verses 11 and 12, the diverse gifts and the diverse responsibilities. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We all have the same value but there are different roles within the body. We all have the same spirit, but we are each unique, uniquely gifted. There is great unity, but yet within the body, there is great diversity. Verse 11, he gave some apostles, apostolos. Now in the technical sense, it's the 12, who then became 11 when Judas killed himself, who then became 12 when Mattias was placed into the apostleship into the group of the apostles, who then became 13 as Paul, uh, an apostle born out of due time. In the general sense, it's one who is sent, but in the technical sense, we have no more apostles. They're done away with. In the sense of people who are sent, then yes, we do. But again, a person who calls himself an apostle doesn't mean it that way. They mean they're like one of the 12, which is now 13, which the number keeps getting all crazy. The Bible doesn't teach that. Verse 11, some prophets. Now, in the technical sense, prophets were foretellers of truth. Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Um, in a general sense, prophets are those who apply God's words to God's people. In a technical sense, we do not have apostles any longer, and we do not have prophets any longer. Those roles have been fulfilled. In a general sense, yes, we have people who speak prophetically. They take the word of God and apply it, but they're not bringing any new prophecy they're simply taking old prophecy. Um, so in a technical sense, no more prophets. In a general sense, sure. He gave some evangelists. You know, I think of Ray Comfort. As I said in Sunday school class, it came up. Billy Graham. Those are people that come to mind when you think of evangelists. Some have the gift to evangelize. Some have the gift of evangelism. But all of us 
are to be evangelizing those around us. The Greek word literally means bringer of good news. All of us are to serve as a bringer of good news. Some pastor, shepherd is the word in the Greek, and it aligns with the biblical terms of overseer or elder. He gave some pastors, some shepherds. He gave, he gave some teachers, really someone who teaches. Now in the Greek, pastors and teachers are linked by a single definite article which suggests a close association of function between these two kinds of ministers who operate within the congregation. I do believe it's two different um, functions. I do believe it's two different ministries. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, gifts of healing, helps administration, varieties of tongues. O'Brien said this, all pastors teach since teaching is an essential part of pastoral ministry, but not all teachers are pastors. I would agree. Verse 12. But all these were given with a twofold purpose, to equip the saints. The King James says to perfect the saints. The Holman says to train the saints. The Greek word is katerizo. It literally means to strengthen, to make something complete. All of these were for the perfecting, training, bringing to completion of the saints. They're for the outfitting of the saints. Why? For the work of ministry and to edify the body. You see, God has blessed his people. He's given them all these offices, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, to prepare them to speak into their lives so that they could do the work of ministry. We often see the ministry as this professional thing that is done by our pastors and our elders and our, and our um, overseers. The ministry is done by the laity. But then equally, what else is done by the laity is to edify the body. So he's given us all these different positions to equip the saints for the work of ministry and for the edification of the body. Paul Tripp said it this way. Your life is much bigger than a good job, an understanding spouse, non-delinquent kids. It is bigger than beautiful gardens, nice vacations, and fashionable clothes. In reality, you and I, if we're Christians, are part of something immense, something that began before we were born and will continue after we die. God is rescuing fallen humanity, transporting them into his kingdom, and progressively changing them into his likeness, and he wants you and I to be a part of it. So a healthy church is marked by spiritual unity, one, and here a healthy church is marked by spiritual diversity, two. We now come to the third point, and that's a healthy church is marked by spiritual maturity. A healthy church is marked by spiritual maturity, verses 13 through 16. Till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Um, so three big points under the heading of a healthy church is marked by spiritual maturity. The third point. Number one, or A if you like, so we don't use numbers, maturity involves doctrinal maturity. Verses 13 and 14, you can see it, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Again, this, this idea of a body of a doctrine, a common body of a doctrine, a common understanding of the scriptures and what it means. Maturity involves doctrinal purity and doctrinal maturity. Notice it's unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Epigenosis is the word. It's this clear, precise, exact knowledge what the Spirit is driving for is a unity within the body of knowledge and a common, complete, clear understanding of Jesus. Detractors against the faith will often claim that to be a believer, you have to stop thinking. You have to sort of check your brain at the door. In fact, it is the exact opposite. Christianity is a thinking and knowing religion. The core subject of our studies is Christ in the gospel. And as we will see next week, we're not learning about Christ. We are learning Christ. And that's a whole different game. And we'll talk more about that next week. I don't want to get ahead of myself. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
So put these together. We're coming to the unity of faith. We're coming to this knowledge, this epigenosis, this complete exact understanding of Christ to this measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here it is the goal. Be like Jesus. Impossible, except the Holy Spirit is given to all and the fruit of the Spirit is given to all to move us to the fullness of Christ. Verse 13, so clearly maturity involves growing in doctrinal stability. What you and I have been taught does matter. What our favorite pastor believes does not matter. What we think does not matter. What's truth matters. What our grandfather and grandmother believe doesn't matter. What the Bible says matters. As we read, God has worked very hard to give us all that we need to discern his word, to grow in our understanding of his word, and especially as it relates to the person of Jesus. So that, verse 14, we should be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now, Paul's mixing of metaphor, a child and a boat, makes a very graphic image of doctrinal instability that we should not be like. It would be enough to say, don't be like a child in your understanding of the scriptures. Don't be like a boat tossed on the open sea and blown all about with crazy winds. But Paul says, don't be like a child in a boat on the open ocean blown all over the place. Don't be like that. Doctrinal maturity. We come to point number two, though. Maturity involves truth joined with love. Verse 14. 15, the conjunction, but, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. You see, it's all about speaking the truth in love, being truthful, but doing so in pure love that we may grow up into him who is the head. And then thirdly, maturity involves contribution, verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So before we fo focus on the contribution we each make, please don't miss the source of our strength. Verse 15, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. We get all we need from Jesus. And this brings us to the last point, and that's this maturity in contribution, every part doing its share, causing the growth of the body, causing the edification of the body, all done in love. This is a picture of a healthy church, drawing its strength from the sovereign of the universe, growing and maturing into the full stature of Christ. I submit them to you. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Lord willing, we'll pick up next time Ephesians 4, 17 through 32. God bless you.